Hey, it's the Chief Bonnie with Board Games and RPGs, and this is Charioteer Race for Glory in Ancient Rome. Racing, baby, it's Circus Maximus, but not the old school Avalon Hill Circus Maximus. Woohoo, been a while. This is brand new GMT, Matt Culkin style. Seca Gohara creator decided to do a race game. Simultaneous play, card melding, and it feels like a race. And it plays really good with two and three. Let's go in and take a look. I'm going to spend a little extra time. All right, we're at the racetrack. So you can see old Circus Maximus here. Now, real quick, you can see we've actually got the two boards making the fairly large racetrack. I've set it up for two players, so I'm not going to do anything with this, but I wanted to just let you know that's how it would look. With your tokens there, they're set up, so I've got mine down here, so you'll be able to see them, but normally you can't see anyone's tokens. They've got eight cards, and I'll show you how the skills setup works. If we were to look all the way over here, you can see the display of the four more additional player boards. The colors are a little pastel. Uh, my, my boy said that uh, this one looks like frost ice or something with Gatorade. He'd never seen that before. I do have a friend that loves purple. He'll be upset that there's no purple. But um, these will be the crowd cards. I'll explain those in a second. The die is the emperor. You're going to get some little bonuses if you do what the emperor wants. Sometimes he's being just really nice. Sometimes he's being mean to you as well. Just got two racers out there matching our colored boards. Again, plays up to six. On the side, we've got a bag that has crowd tokens. So if you do a really good move, the crowd goes crazy. You get to draw from the bag and they're kind of like your tokens here, but everybody starts with these same ones. Those are random and special. These are damage tokens. The damage will come in here and then they'll push over and this will slow you down as you're racing. And I will get to that in a second. You can also see a very, very large stack of cards. Um, you will always have eight cards in your hand. So you'll refill at the end of your turn. And then the crowd cards, you're only looking at this one. And again, I'll explain how it works in a second. But you can see what the crowd is kind of going to be doing on the next turn and the next turn. So you can do a little bit of strategic planning inside your tactical moves. Let me get a little bit more over the top of the board. I'll open these cards up and kind of show you how they look. All right, so on a turn, everybody's going to be looking at their hand of cards. They'll be making their selections. And once everybody has picked a set of cards, let's just say we'll come and explain these in a second. But let's say I was going to do this. I would set them down on the table. We would look around the table. Everybody's got their sets that they're going to play. Boom, we would flip them over Yeah, with the boom. And um, in rank order of whoever's in first, second, of course, when you're starting off, we're all together. And then it's a little bit more of a randomized start. But in the order of who's first, they'll do their moves, then second and third, fourth, fifth, sixth, if you're playing with that many players. And again, I'll explain the whip here in a second, but what you're trying to do is meld cards together and get the most movement you can out of them. So let me set these down so that I'm not moving them around. Now, the sets that I have, um, I could come in and I can make some fours. So the melding is going to be the number that's inside the shape and then the color. So here I have three fours. So I would add in the three symbols and then whatever the numeral is that's inside those symbols. So this would allow me to sprint seven. Green is sprinting. They're higher numbers generally. So I could go seven spaces forward with my chariot. Another option, I could sprint with these um, twos, these green twos, but I only have four of them. So four, five, six, I'd be able to make six moves, not quite as optimal um, with that meld. And then I have an interesting situation here. So 
I have an option where I could do the fours, the orange or yellow, sorry, the yellow fours. And it does match the crowd card, which I'm going to show you in a second. So those fours would allow me to move four plus the three symbols. Again, we're back to seven. Not too bad, but we're going to talk about what each of these things does as a special move as well. Then I have these twos, and there's a two on this one as well. So I could slide the two over and play these three cards. Three is the max number of cards you can play together. So I could play these three cards here and do one, two, three, four, five of the symbols plus the two. Again, we're back to seven. Now you can see I've got these black cornering sections. I'm going to get into the cornering in the racetrack in a second. Now the whip, the whip is interesting if I decide to use it. There's some special rules. I can't use it if I'm the number one or the first chariot. And if I use it, it'll be at the end of my movement. Um, it'll move me another five spaces, but it gets a little interesting. If I run into another chariot that's in front of me, I'll actually have to stop. It's as if I can't keep whipping the horses to get more speed out of them because now I'm in a congested area. Since you don't know what everybody else is doing, uh, and I've done this before, I'll play, a, I'll play the whip card hoping to get the full five bonus, and it turns out someone moved a lot slower than me, and I'm only two behind them when it's my turn to use the whip, and I've kind of wasted the use of it. And again, you can't use it if you're in first place, so it's not like you can stretch your lead. It's great for catching up. So I'm looking at this set. Again, kind of don't worry about the whip. That's the whip. That's all I'll explain on it. But right above, so I've panned up slightly. I can see what the next turn is going to have in the next turn, but right here we're focused on this turn. And this is the crowd card. I'm not, I don't have any of the red cards, those little flame symbols with the one, but I do have that recovery symbol, the yellow four. So if I play for the fours, I can end up adding this card and that symbol. So if I had the fours, I would have one, two, three, four, plus the numeral value of four. So now I'm moving eight. Not too bad. Ideally, that would get me the furthest down the road. But what these different colors do are add some nice bonuses. So the green sprints, there's, they're basically higher numbers. So generally, if you've got them, you're going to be able to move a little bit further just naturally. The recovery, these little yellow symbols, will help me remove damage that's happened to my chariot. The damage comes when people play these red symbols, they'll start doing damage to every other chariot that's racing. Now, I don't have any damage right now, so I may not want to do the optimal move of four, moving me furthest, because I don't have any damage to remove. If I'd had damage, I would get to remove half of whatever the damage is. Let's just say I had two damage cubes. I'd be able to get rid of one. And the damage cubes minus one off of your movement. So you want to be able to clear those when you've collected them. So in this case, I might just decide, you know what, I'm going to do the sprinting twos. Not that fast, but I'm going to go ahead and do it. And you can see here this emperor die. Before the turn, the emperor die is rolled, and it's what the emperor is wanting to happen. And the cool thing is, so on the skills, let me rotate over uh, on the skills. If I pick the green twos, green is all that matters, and my skills would move up one at the end of the turn. So I would just advance one up. But because that emperor die was also green, meaning he wanted more of these sprint moves, I would get a bonus of yet another skill move. So if I pay attention to what the emperor wants, I can move these skills up quicker. And that's important because anything in this area here will get the chariot a plus one. Now, I wouldn't get it on this turn. It would be the next because it was over here where there's no bonuses. And then eventually, if you land, the first one to come over into the big bonus gets a 
plus three. Again, future turns after they land there, but then they can't move anymore. So if I got green into the plus three, anytime I did a sprint move, it would take me a while to get the skills there. But anytime I do a sprint move, boom, I'm getting a plus three on it. You can see the next one's a plus five. So if I moved up the yellow recovery cube, maybe I'd moved and done a lot of skills throughout the game. And if something was looking like this, well, now it's taking me probably more than half the race to get here. Let's assume these had climbed up and they were just kind of sitting around like so. But now anytime I do a sprint, I'm going to get a plus three. And anytime I do a recovery, I'm going to get a plus five. And again, you can see what the next turn is going to be for the crowd and the next turn. So you can save some of your cards based on what's coming. So obviously there's a couple twos coming up. So if I save these twos that I have over here, I'm going to have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So seven symbols plus the number that's in the symbol giving me a move of nine. And if anybody has decided to do, maybe somebody else at the table had the red ones, they would have put damage on me. Now I'm gonna be able to heal it. So I'm kind of, I'm predicting what might happen. And even if nobody puts damage on me, I'm gonna get a little bit more movement out of the next crowd card. All right, I wanted to zoom in and show what would happen if someone had had the reds to play. So again, these are just other types of movement cards. So we would count the number of symbols. One, two, three. I get to use the crowd card. Four, five. And then the numeral that is inside, one. So I'm only going to move six with this card play. But because I've been able to use three cards, I'm going to do one minor damage to all the other players at the table. So minor damage means that I would come in, let me get that proper, and everybody else at the table is going to have to put one of these cubes in their box. Now, other people might have also done damage. So you could be catching multiple cubes of damage, but in a single turn, you can never get more than three. Now, I could have had, let me pull this off real quick just to show you. So what if... I'd played something like this. Well, now I'm playing not for the threes. Again, we're still focused on the ones. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, plus the symbol. I'd be moving seven and I've got four cards. Remember, the most you can ever play is three, but you can use the crowd card. So that can get you up to the four. And now I've done my movement. I would have moved my chariot. And now everybody at the table, because I've used four cards, is getting what's called major damage, which would be two of these cubes piling in. And that's everybody at the table is picking up two. Then the turn ends. These don't hurt anybody while they're in the damage box. But as the turn ends, sorry, the attack box, but as the turn ends, they move over to your damage box and anything inside the damage box is going to slow you down as a minus one. So that would be minus two on the next turn unless I use that recovery yellow movement, which would help me pull those damage cubes off. So let me explain cornering. So right off the bat, you can see there's these darker shaded spots. Think of them almost like piano keys. If, um, let's say I did uh, a sprint and I was going to move six, if I'm sprinting and not cornering, I'm going to show you corner cards in a second, I have to hit both the regular spot and then like a piano key. A regular spot, a piano key. Regular spot, piano key. So it's really, I'm not cornering efficiently as I come around. So one, two, three, four, five, six and I'm in the outside of that turn, which is huge in racing as you're coming around because if somebody else is cornering, again, I'm gonna show you the cards in a second. Let's say they were moving six, but they use corner cards. They go one, two, three, four, five, six, and they're all on that inside. They don't have to do this popping back and forth. That's huge because normally when you pass somebody, if I came up to pass, I would go one, two to the outside, three to the inside, 
four, five, and then six. If I was doing a cornering move, I wouldn't have to hit that key. But if somebody's stuck on the outside and I'm cornering, I can just move right around them. So what do these cornering cards look like? You keep saying cornering. Well, they're usually lower numbers. So you can see here, I've got three cards. They have six different cornering symbols, the black racetrack. Let me zoom in just a little bit. So this is going to let me move seven. Now I don't have to use it in a corner. I can use it in a straightaway, but if I'm in a corner, I don't have to do that, that uh, keyboard type movement. So way more efficient to save those black cornering cards for the corners. Not to mention, you're cutting off anybody on the outside. And these cornering cards, if there had been cornering symbols up here, again, you can always use the crowd card. Same goes if we had had cornering, that would mean the emperor would give you a bonus one on the skill dice. So if I did the cornering, I would do my moves, hopefully very efficiently through the corner. I would move my black token up one, unless it was the bonus from the emperor, then I would go two, and my turn's over, and we go to the next person that's in order. Let me pop back to the table, and I'll give you my final thoughts. All right, final thoughts, and I wanted to give a little bit more structure to my reviews. So, I've got three areas that I'm going to focus on in regards to board games. Look, with two subcategories, the box, basically how sturdy the box is, and the art on the box, front and back, the components inside the box. Ease of learning, how easy is it to work through the rules and even to teach, and then finally just gameplay. I'm going to score them 1 to 10 and kind of give little explanations on both. So, so first, the look. The exterior of the box, as you would expect from GMT, the box is great. Super sturdy, thick, strong. The artwork is gorgeous. Uh, it's so evocative. When I saw it, I was like, yes, charioteer. And the back, of course, are always doing good with their blurbs and, and you know, ease of play. For the components, came down just a little bit for me. I gave it a six. I really didn't like those pastel colors. As soon as I opened it up, I was like, ugh, you know, I always like playing with red, and it doesn't feel like I'm playing with red. It feels like I'm paying, playing with pink, which is fine. I still played with pink. But, um, you know, I, I mentioned in, inside the components there that I even have a friend that loves purple. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking, okay, maybe there were some development reasons where colors were picked so that they're more easy to kind of pick up around the table. Maybe that's the case. For me, I kind of like regular red, regular green. I know they had to be a little bit lighter so you can see everything, but just my little tidbit there. Um, the cards themselves uh, display all the information you need. They're a little bit flimsy, so they've got a nice finish to them. I think they'll hold up. Uh, but they are a little bit light and flimsy. Now, you wouldn't want them too thick because you got a huge stack of them. So I could see them pitching around and all that. So I get it, but mm, you'll see they're just a little flimsy. Ease of learning. Eight. This game is great. First of all, that splash page on the front. Set it up and start just kind of playing through. Um, and it might even, I'm sure for most people, it'd be a little bit higher than the eight. Maybe I'm a little slow. What I did miss coming through was um, like the first playthrough, I actually thought I could have, you could play four cards down and still use the crowd. No, it's three cards. The crowd can make a fourth. Um, so I'd missed some pretty easy rules, but there's a few little caveats um, or exceptions. But again, uh, nothing difficult here at all. Um, if somebody's playing and has never done any melding of cards, sometimes they're like, hmm. But it takes almost no time to say, gather your symbols of whatever color, and they have to match the number. And then you're going to count your symbols plus the numeral that's in the middle of those symbols, and you're off and running. Eh, a few mistakes here or there sometimes, but again, nothing difficult at all. Um, and once they got it, it's very, very intuitive. Gameplay, nine. This feels like a race. You're racing. It's quick. Uh, the idea that you're 
picking your cards. Sometimes there's a little AP when someone's looking over two or three different decisions or skills or what do they want to do, but you get those down, everybody's down, and then who's in first? Play, second play, third play, fourth play, and boom, 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 get your moves down, and, uh, you know, literally we would get rid of the crowd card, shift them, new crowd, roll the, the die, and you're on to the next, uh, refill your cards back up to eight, and you're going. Gameplay was really, really fast and exciting because of that simultaneous play. And the decisions, are you attacking everybody at the table? Do you need to do some recovery to, to get some of that damage off? Are you sprinting in the straightaway? Do you have the cards to get you around the corner, get you around the curve, and kind of get that inside? Boom, you're, you're ahead of them, and now you're off and running. So it, it did exactly what it should do. Matt Calkins talked about in his designer notes, which are awesome, about how he wanted the players to be inside the headspace of the charioteer thinking about the moves that they were going to be making, kind of, um, but that it needed to feel like a race, that it, it uh, needed to have tactical decisions that were being made while still holding on to some of the strategic decisions of those skills. I like the idea that you can be starting to make some plans like I want to bump those skills up so that in the final third of the game, that last lap, I'm tearing it up. Now you still got to get the cards. So because of the finite deck, you know, you, you've got to be able to have the cards to do what you want to do as well. So it lends in you know, some uncertainty. Played really, really well with two. I didn't think it was going to. I, I figured it would play okay. Um, I was hoping my wife would want to play. She loved it. Um, was asking to play it right away a second time. Asked me to leave it set up on the table in the kitchen so that when I got home the next day from work, we could play it again. And it really still felt like a race at two. So if you're used to just playing with a couple, um, and I don't think it's going to be as good as the six folks that I've got getting ready to come over, um, but it played two wonderfully. So um, don't worry about it if you think, well, most of my gameplay will be with uh, you know a friend or a spouse or something, because the, it still felt very, very race-like. And I got a feeling it's going to scale all the way up to six very, very well, just with some of those pole position moves kind of coming in. We obviously didn't have quite as much of that because there was just two of us, or in one case, three. So um, the, the skills movement is great. Um, playing to the crowd and getting to reach inside the bag if you get six symbols. You know, you did something really exciting for the crowd, so you get to go into the bag and pull out something random, a chit that you can use to plus up some move or maybe a whip or some other things you can use. Um, the randomness, uh, trying to, not the randomness, but I kept misplaying the whip. So you don't know what everybody else is doing. And I would think they're, they're about ready to sprint ahead. And instead they would they would do something less optimal. And I played the whip token, so I didn't know. And all of a sudden I'm running up on them and the whip's either almost, well, it's almost useless. I had it once where I got one movement out of it. I was like, come on, man, what a waste. <laughs> so, but that idea of when can I get it in there? And again, the attacks. So that idea that, uh, ooh, that crowd card's gonna work. Again, maybe it's not the most optimal move. Maybe it is, but I'll have four cards, which is going to give a major attack, put two cubes in everybody's attack box that's going to slide over into the damage box, then they're going to have to be trying to recover and get those out of there. And I can maybe start to get inside their head and get inside their, their deck management by me sending some damage their way. Meanwhile, I'm up and running. Really love the aspect of the race. Still still a little abstracted. You know, it's not like you're, you've are you got spikes on your chariot Ben-Hur style and you're coming over. You know, when you do damage, you're doing damage to everybody. Uh, but I just think of it as like I'm being really mean and ramming and you know, whatever. Chief, bonding with board games and RPGs. Get out to the Circus Maximus. I think you'll enjoy yourself. See ya. Bye.